Why do unsolved cases fascinate us so much? Is it the desire to know what truly happened? Why it happened? Who was behind it? The sad reality is that the longer a mystery remains unsolved, the less likely we are to find an answer. Evidence is lost, witnesses pass away, and the authorities can't spare the resources to keep investigating them. The case we're looking at today may not fall into that category. After a young girl went missing back in the 80s, the accidental discovery of her remains has led to an arrest of a long time suspect and possibly justice for her family. Let's dive into the unsolved case of Janelle Matthews. Born on February 9th, 1972, Janelle had an unconventional start in life. Her mom, Terry Vieira Martinez, gave birth to Janelle when she was extremely young and had to give Janelle up for adoption when she was just two months old. She was adopted by James and Gloria Matthews, who already had a daughter of their own named Jennifer. They wanted a big family, but after struggling for a long time to have their biological daughter, Daughter, they decided to adopt. Janelle had a happy childhood in Greeley, Colorado, where she lived in a middle-class neighborhood and attended Franklin Middle School, where she was a member of the choir. December 20th, 1984 was a very busy day for the Matthews family. Janelle was performing in a school Christmas concert, Jennifer had a basketball game, and Gloria had to fly out of state to visit her dad who was really sick. Not just that, but it was right before Christmas, undoubtedly the busiest time of the year for a lot of families. That evening, James took Janelle to her school, where she boarded a coach bound for a retirement home, where the Christmas concert would take place. After he dropped her off, he took Jennifer to her basketball game and stayed to watch, since Janelle had already arranged for a ride home with a friend, Deanne Ross. Footage from the concert captured one of the last times Janelle would be seen alive. The concert finished at 8.15 p.m., and Janelle was driven home by Deanne and her dad, who watched her go into her house to make sure she made it all the way. At 8.30 p.m., Janelle took a phone call for someone looking to speak with her dad. She took a message and left it written on a pad next to the phone. After that, it looks as though she turned on the TV and a space heater, which she used to dry her shoes. What happened after that is kind of a mystery. James arrived home an hour later to an empty house, but the TV and the space heater were still running. Janelle had even left her socks hanging over the back of the couch to dry them from the snow outside. He tried not to think much of it at first. This was a close-knit community. Maybe Janelle had just gone for a walk around the block with a friend. But as time went on, James started to get a weird feeling that something wasn't right. Plus, his daughters were usually pretty good with letting their parents know if they were going somewhere, especially after dark. Jennifer arrived home half an hour later, and she too hadn't seen her sister. Getting worried, James called their pastor to ask if he'd seen Janelle. He also called some of their friends. Nobody had seen her since she was dropped off at home. That was when he called the police. Officers started turning up pretty quickly, and they managed to get some kind of idea what happened. They searched the outside of the house and discovered footprints that didn't belong to anyone in the house. The footprints looked like someone had been snooping around and trying to look through the windows, maybe looking for Janelle? But that wasn't all. Outside the garage, the pattern of the prints looked like there'd been some kind of struggle. However, there were no unfamiliar vehicle tracks. It was like, whoever was scuffling just vanished. The police considered that maybe Janelle had run away, but they just had to take one look inside the house to know there was no motive for her to do that. The Matthews home was fully decked out for Christmas, their tree was fully decorated with a pile of presents underneath, and a stocking with Janelle's name was hanging over the fireplace. Years later, Jennifer responded to that theory in a pretty typical sisterly way. She was dramatic. If she'd run away, she would have left a note to let everyone know how upset she was. That was enough to tell the police that Janelle had probably been taken from her home against her will. By the next morning, a full search and investigation was underway, with the help from the community and the FBI. The police knew they had to act fast. We've got to remember that this was before they had all the technology that helps solve crimes today. There was no DNA or fingerprint analysis, and security cameras were still super new technology. Search parties combed fields and surrounding areas for anything pointing to Janelle's whereabouts. Neighbors, teachers, and friends were all interviewed by police, and even though no Nobody knew what happened to her, they all agreed that Janelle was not the type of kid to just walk away. The authorities even discovered where her birth mom was and kept tabs on her for over six weeks in case she had something to do with Janelle's disappearance. They never told her that she was being watched or that something happened to Janelle. As the days passed, Christmas came and went and Janelle's presents stayed under the Christmas tree. Her mom, Gloria, couldn't stand to get rid of them and kept them in the house for a year after Janelle vanished. On February 8th, Janelle's birthday, 600 people volunteered to carry out a massive search that covered 4,000 square miles of Weld County. Unfortunately, they still found
found nothing. Janelle's parents didn't give up hope that their daughter was still out there somewhere alive, and they did everything in their power to find her and get her home safely. They went on a media tour around the country to raise awareness and keep Janelle's story alive so that someday, someone might find her. The case got so much attention that President Ronald Reagan even mentioned it during a speech about missing kids across America. But every possible trail only led to dead ends. With every new inquiry and tip-off, the investigators were constantly finding themselves back at square one. And then the inevitable happened. People started to move on and forget. By the end of 1985 and the anniversary of Janelle's disappearance, her family had started to accept the possibility that she was dead. They donated the gifts they bought for her last Christmas and tried to get through the holidays. For Gloria, her greatest fear wasn't that Janelle was dead. It was that she was being kept somewhere and being made to do things she didn't want to. This is sadly the case for hundreds of people that go missing every year. Although the case remained open, without any leads or meaningful evidence, the police had run out of ideas. On the 10-year anniversary of her disappearance, Janelle was declared legally dead. That wasn't the end of the heartbreak for this family, when in 1997, they received a letter that they never expected to get from Janelle's birth mom. On February 9th, 1972, I gave birth to a baby girl at Cottage Hospital in Santa Barbara, California. A search consultant recently helped me locate the baby I gave up for adoption. After extensive efforts, it was found that her name is Janelle Matthews. I hope that your hearts will be open for a possible reunion sometime in the future. Of course, since she wasn't legally entitled to that information, nobody had told Terry that Janelle had been missing for years. Although the Matthews loved that Terry wanted to get to know Janelle properly, they couldn't help but feel guilty. They'd been trusted to keep Janelle safe, and in their own eyes, they failed to do that. As time went on, their sleepy town started to modernize, and it didn't suit the Matthews anymore. James and Gloria moved out and retired in Costa Rica, while Jennifer, now grown up, remained in Colorado. Then, in 2019, there was finally a breakthrough in this case. Some construction workers installing oil pipes 19 miles south of Janelle's home were horrified when they came across a skeleton in the path of where they were digging. It didn't take long for the remains to be identified as Janelle, as the clothes found at the scene matched those that she was wearing when she vanished. The coroner's report said that she died from a bullet wound to the head. Many wondered where the police planned to go from here. It was amazing that they found Janelle at all, since it was a total accident, but would they be able to do anything further? Well, shockingly, within a couple of months, they managed to make an arrest, and it turns out this man was a person of interest for decades. Stephen Pankey was in his late 60s when police came to arrest him at his home in Idaho. He'd lived in Greeley for years with his family and worked as a janitor at the same church Janelle and her family attended. He lived less than two miles from their house and was often seen watching students walk home from the same middle school Janelle attended. According to reports, Stephen tried to insert himself into the case a lot throughout the years and often claimed he had information that was inconsistent and incriminating. He lied to the police about his whereabouts during and after the period that Janelle vanished, and he said he'd never met her family, even though they attended the same church. He also said some pretty concerning stuff. During a church sermon, the pastor said that he believed Janelle would be found safe. According to Stephen's ex-wife, Angela Hicks, he muttered to her, false prophet. After Janelle vanished, he was constantly reading or listening to the news on the radio. A few weeks after, Angela remembers him constantly digging in their backyard. In 2008, Stephen lost his own son to homicide. Angela claims that while she was standing at the graveside, Stephen muttered something pretty damaging. I hope God didn't allow this to happen because of Janelle Matthews. Stephen is currently awaiting his trial, which should take place in July of this year. He's pleaded guilty to all charges against him, which includes first-degree homicide and remains in jail as he's unable to come up with the money for his $5 million bail. His attorney is absolutely convinced that Stephen is innocent, but with the certainty of the state that he did kill Janelle, I guess only time will tell. Now that her remains have been recovered, Janelle's family have been able to give her a proper burial. They had a closure celebration at Sunnyview Church, where over 500 people turned up to pay their respects to Janelle. Among those was Terry, Janelle's birth mom, who's become a friend of the family since writing to them in 1997. That brings us fully up to date with this case. Will you guys be following to see what happens at Stephen Pankey's trial? I sure will be. Thanks for watching today's video, you guys. If you liked it, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel.